right now is Mike McNally, who is chairman of the board of directors of the United States Green Building Council, former CEO of Skanska USA. That's it. That's, That's it. it. That's it. That's it. That's got, that, got that pronunciation yeah. right. So, so Mike, you've, uh, you're at the helm of, of an organization that, that certainly not only transformed the market, but there's more market transformation going on. What, what is your vision for USGBC uh, and whether that aligns with, uh, I hope it does, with USGBC's vision for the future? No, absolutely it aligns. Uh, I mean, really what's happening with USGBC is it's going, it's going global. I mean, you saw that with the Green Build in India. You, you, you see that with the Green Build in, in South America, in Europe, in China. So, I mean, it's an exciting time, and, and the lead standard is growing. And, and uh, you'll see GBCI certifying projects all over the world, more and more and more of that. So uh, that's one aspect. The other aspect is for us to kind of integrate and work better with other certification systems, uh, I mean, other standards. Um, and uh, that we're making pretty good progress there. So we're trying to take this global, um, spread, the, spread the standard, lead standard across the globe, um, have GBCI certify that standard as well as, as others, and make it easier to integrate these standards. Because right now there is some market confusion as to the many standards there are, they don't talk to one another, and to 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 consolidate some of those and get more clarity. The um, pro proliferation is perhaps not the right word, but the expansion of rating systems um, is was that done. Uh, consciously to, to sort of hit all the, the points that need to be brought together? I, I think so. I, I think that each market has their each uh, different approaches to being sustainable uh, and they have to be addressed. Um, lead by itself wasn't going to wasn't going to get it done outside of the building environment. So things like sites, which thank you very much for your efforts in making that the law of the land in Rhode Island, our, both of our home state. Um, so, you know, it, it, they, they do what in the end we, we acquire and or develop those standards, and then the long-term vision is to integrate those into one, if we can, to, to get rid of some of the market confusion um, and to make them talk to one another, and credits in one would count for, count, count for uh, certification in another. I mean, I think that's Mahesh's vision. Yeah. One of the things that I've noticed is that every time I see the, the metrics, so to speak, the mm -hmm. statistics, um, they're, they're powerful in, in terms of the, the impact, the market transformation. But I also know that um, people don't people don't realize, you know, what what the impact, what the what the footprint is of U.S. Green Building Council and their cohorts around the world and, and the rating systems. I mean, just think about it. We just had Green Build in India and China. I mean, we've only scratched the surface. Uh, I mean, it it all should explode, and it's pretty exciting that that U.S. GBC uh, and GBCI have been been part of that. I mean, I, I think globally we can really make a difference. It's already, you know, for the new building environment here in the United States, we have an enormous market share. That, that That's just happened. You know, our next approach here is existing buildings. We're really going to make an impact, um, and we're working hard on that, and then going global. So so, the, so there's still a lot of work to do, but it's uh, we're making pretty good progress. Let me, let me circle back, because you were part of a global Organization, mm -hmm. Skanska. Yes, yes, yep. How do how do uh, companies like Skanska uh, view the U.S. Green Building Council, all the all the lead rating systems? Uh, Skanska embraced USGBC. Um, you know, uh, uh, they 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 just love their relationship with USGBC. I don't, I don't. You may know Beth Heider was the the chair of the board maybe you know five six years ago. Uh, she's an, a, a Skanska employee. So um, it, they actually took it to Sweden. Now uh, there's a, there's a Swedish Building Council that was kind of. Uh, created to uh, kind of copy USGBC, um, and I think that it, it all started here, and we should be proud of that. Um, but Skanska was, works hard at being green. It certainly is something to be proud of, and Mike, we're, we're proud that you're doing what you're doing. And uh, thanks for taking the time. We thanks, Ken. It. Nice talking to you. Same here. Thank you. We're graced here today with Jamie Statter, Vice President of Strate Strategic Relations for the U.S. Green Building Council, and we're going to talk a little bit about some new programs that USGBC and GBCI has, SITES and LEAD ND, in particular, how, what's happening in Rhode Island and, and what the importance of that is for the rest of the country and the rest of the world. Jamie? Hi, Ken. Nice to see you again. Same here. Well, we're really excited about what happened with Rhode Island this last year. Rhode Island became the first state to formally adopt the Sustainable Sites Initiative 
uh, via a legislative process, which is a remarkable achievement and something that as U.S. Green Building Council and GBCI, we are thrilled to support. The Sustainable Sites Initiative takes the model of LEED and extends it beyond the building to drive sustainable outcomes on lands, manage our resources in the air, in water, um, and make strategic decisions about land planning and development. How do you see um, sites in particular uh, touching upon a, the, a greater population than, say, LEED does? Well, SITES uh, covers everything external to the building, so it allows us to talk about sustainability in areas that lead uh, left out because they don't have a building on them, like parks, common spaces, streetscapes, but it also enhances the sustainability approaches of LEED by going one step further and looking at the sustainable outcomes that go external to the building envelope. Uh, so when you see a LEED Platinum building, uh, you can also look and have a site's platinum space outside that would create enhanced environmental benefits such as resource management, ecosystem services, but also for the humans that occupy the world in which we live. Uh, exponential health benefits in the form of cleaner air, clean water, and uh, places for social interaction, mental respite, and access to nature. So it, it has a pretty holistic effect that enhances LEAD. Uh, so it's a program that we're thrilled to support and very pleased with Rhode Island's leadership on that as well. Well, going back to Rhode Island, since uh, we both brought it up, um, what is the importance of that and, and how can uh, the Rhode Island's experience, which is yet to come, uh, how can that be leveraged? Well, Rhode Island is the first to put a legislative process in place that adopted sites and the governor just signed into law the revised Green Building Act, which asks for sites to be incorporated in uh, state-owned land development uh, activities. Other states should and can do this uh, and should follow Rhode Island's leadership. The model of LEAD was sort of a three-pronged approach and that's how we're looking at sites as well. One is create a community of committed professionals that are implementing the rating system in their work uh, and such as yourself who's a sites AP. Uh, the second piece is translate global goals, and in this case, the case of sites, the global goals are resiliency and sustainability on land into project by project implementation. And that is essential because we can talk about buzzwords like resiliency and sustainability all we want, but we need an actual plan to get that done, and that happens at a project level. Uh, and then third, most importantly to the discussion of what Rhode Island as a state has done and what other states should do, create and stimulate it local and state action for scale. So once states start to do this in their own work, uh, incorporate it into code, ask that developers utilize sites for expedite, uh, expedited permitting or preferential tax treatment, that creates a whole market effect. And then all of a sudden, these big lofty goals are happening all over the world and in practice. And, and that's the vision we have. And it happens one state at a time, one city at a time. So we're very pleased that Rhode Island has been the first to put a stake in the ground on this. Good to hear it. And I, I'm certainly glad and appreciative of the, the support the USGBC and GBCI has given us. One of the things that uh, struck me as we were developing support for sites or trying to get it through the legislation is that sites, I, I, not in comparison to or not instead of lead, but there's a, a, a tremendous affinity or, or door opening effect that sites have has with uh, the general population more so than lead because people are saying oh I don't I can't do that I'm not an architect I'm not an engineer but people feel the landscape they're in touch with it mm -hmm. every day I know they're in touch with buildings every day but somehow they they just have this innate connection with the landscape and so from my standpoint what I see sites doing is opening up the world of sustainability to a greater population and to use the the theme of green build all in. Yeah, that's absolutely right. We have to think about where we uh, interact as humans in every way, not just the building, but beyond it. Uh, and it's good to hear that you think that there's a more sort of democratization potential of sites. And, and that's something that we'll definitely be considering as we watch the program grow, which it should be doing at an exponential rate from here on out. So. I certainly hope so. Thank you very much, Jamie. Jamie it's, it's great talking to you as always. Thank you very much.
Well, we're really excited about the early work from Rhode Island, the commitments to sustainability in public buildings and facilities. And that's been a uh, part of a story that we've been able to tell uh, to states and cities across the U.S. So the Green Buildings Act in Rhode Island has, is, remains in our portfolio of good news, right? And since then, we've been so excited to expand that conversation, uh, working with many people with the USGBC Rhode Island chapter, uh, of course, and uh, with members of the legislature and the governor's office to expand what we're talking about with green public property, right? And so the ability for us to now work with the state of Rhode Island and, uh, and local entities to expand sustainability leadership beyond buildings and into the spaces between allows us to really expand that conversation and the sustainability metrics that are being used for better performance Especially in, the, in a state like Rhode Island, where you've got uh, the the, uh, the amount of uh, of coastline and water resources that need protection, and it's not just the building. We have other things that 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 play into that ecosystem that need management. So we're very excited about the new initiative that was uh, just adopted uh, by the state of Rhode Island uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, and we're expecting and hoping that this will be the first of many stories to come where other cities and states can make similar commitments to greener public lands. First, I am so proud of the partnership demonstrated by state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Just last month, the state became the first state in the nation to reference both sites and lead ND rating system in public law. Of course, no pioneering policy can exist without its champions. So first, our advocacy team, then our own USGBC board chair, Mike McNally, to David Witter, the guy who funded this event, to Ken Piarski, Filarski, Ken Filarski, sorry, current chair and co-founder of the USGBC Rhode Island community and beyond. It truly was a team effort. So let's give them a big round of applause. For I'm here now with the president and CEO of the United States Green Building, or U.S. Green Building Council, I should say, Mahesh Ramanujam. Mahesh, you, you, your thoughts, your inspiration just, just went out like a, like a meteor, like a comet to the audience. Do you have anything else to convey to our network, our listeners? I think we should be all in. We should be committed to everything that we care about, most importantly, the people, the planet, and the progress. Because if we are not going to do it, who else is going to do it? It's amazing the transformation that's happened in the last 19, 20 years. What do you see for the next 19 or 20 years? Next time, next 19 to 20 years, we need to cross what we actually committed to, a green building for everyone within a generation, which means that you have to double down, triple down, build leadership, make projects happen, make initiatives happen, because we care about this home. And we need to make sure that we leave it in a better place than where we received it for our children's children and for the children's to come. Thank you very much, Mahesh. Thank it's you, Ken. A, it's, a, it's a privilege knowing you and working with you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ken. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Now, as a nonpartisan organization and a global leader, UOGC goes to great lengths, great lengths to bring people in. But what we will not do is turn our backs on science, data are our fundamental responsibility to leave this planet full of abundance. This is RNN, the Renewable Now Network, where sustainability makes sense.